Welcome back to Bible 101. This is Lesson 5, Part 3. We already looked at the law, and now we're going to look at the gospel. In the law, we looked at it from Romans chapter 3, and now we're going to continue right after that section in Romans 3. Romans 3, start, uh, starting at verse 21. So we just saw that the law, God's law, his expectations for us, it doesn't turn us into better people. It just makes us aware of how terrible we are naturally. God has a solution for that. We've seen the sickness. We've seen, I need help. Now he shows us where we can find righteousness to be right with God. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24. Uh, maybe I'll just back up one verse so you can kind of see where we're at. So verse 20 says, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. A lot of big theological words in there, but we'll take a look at them. Good news here. So number one, there is righteousness. Where is it found? Look at verse 21. Righteousness apart from the law has been made known. So you're not going to find righteousness before God. You're not going to find holiness in the law side. It just shows us where we've failed. But there is righteousness. The law and the prophets testified. The Old Testament told us about this righteousness. It's the righteousness of God. And it comes to us from God apart from the law. How does God bring that righteousness to me? Verse 22, this righteousness is given through faith. It's given as a gift through faith. The Holy Spirit works this trust in our hearts so we can believe this is true through faith. So if it is apart from the law, this righteousness is apart from the law, it is given to us from God through faith, where would you have to put faith? If you're going to mark faith on this diagram, does it come on the law side? No, it can't. Faith is not something that we can do or that God demands from us, but faith has to come from God on the gospel side, something that he gives. Faith, a gift of God, just like forgiveness. So faith is gospel, too, that God gives to us. So, number three, no matter how many good works we might try to do, what would God's verdict have to be? Verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned. We can't jump across to God's glory and be able to be right with him. We'll always fall short. All have sinned and have fallen short. Getting to heaven would be like trying to jump the Grand Canyon. It doesn't matter if you could jump... 20, 40, or 100 feet, you'd still fall short of getting to the other side and perish. But according to verse 24, God has declared me justified. Verse 24 said, all are justified. So all have sinned, all fall short, and all are justified freely by his grace. So justified, there's a word to, to know and have a handle on. It means declared, not guilty like the gavel banging down and the judge says you're innocent so we're declared not guilty innocent so number five pick all the different ways god describes our justification just listen again to how he piles it on this is all from the gospel this is what god is giving to us justified freely by his grace through the redemption jesus buying us back that came uh, through the redemption 
that came by Christ Jesus. This is God doing all of the work, taking all of the initiative, all of the action. He just piles it on. This is my work, my work, my work, God says, not your work, this forgiveness. In verses 9 through 12, we heard about how we had destroyed our relationship with God. Verse 25 tells us what our relationship to God is now. See the word there? God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement by the shedding of his blood. We're atoned for. Uh, you can think of the word atonement if you kind of break up the word atone at one with God. Instead of being enemies separated from each other, we're now at one with him. If you glance ahead at Romans 5, probably turn the page here, verses 18 and 19, you can see how many people this declaration of righteousness holds true for. How many people can God say, your sins are forgiven, you're righteous in my sight. Listen to Romans 5, 18 and 19. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. One person sinned, death for everyone. One person lived a holy and righteous life, life and justification for everyone. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, Adam sinned, everyone was made a sinner, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Jesus obeyed perfectly, he's our perfect savior, we will be righteous, as will all. So really, how many people does this hold true for? Everyone, everyone sinned, all are justified. That is a truth called objective justification. It is just true that God has declared the world not guilty of sin. Why is that so vital to know that God has said of this entire world, every person, you're not guilty, you're innocent. Jesus died for your sins. Jesus' blood covers every sin. Well, it helps me know for sure, for sure, for sure that he died for me. It also encourages me to tell other people because I know that I can tell truthfully anybody, Jesus died for you. He's declared you innocent. Your sins are forgiven. The law's purpose was to show me my sin and my need for a savior. What's the gospel's purpose? It's to show my savior, to show that I have the savior I need. The law says you have a need, you're a sinner. The gospel says here's the solution. If you didn't know the need, you wouldn't appreciate the solution. So now I'm just going to quickly review one of the main parts of our church services. It's called confession and absolution. We have something where we confess our sins before God. We show how we've failed God living up to his expectations, but then we hear the gospel, the absolution, the forgiveness that God gives. So usually a pastor says something like, Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. And then we begin with the part that's more confessing our sins, acknowledging how we stand up in front of God's law. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I'm by nature sinful and that I've disobeyed you in my words, thoughts, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. All those sections of law, we deserve God's punishment. We haven't done what is good, we've done what is evil. But I'm truly sorry for my sin, repentance, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then the pastor gets to declare, to just so forcefully say, God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us. He's given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by Christ's authority, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Notice how forcefully that declaration of forgiveness is. No strings attached. It's, it's not if you live right, if you do good. It's Jesus died and Jesus rose and your sins are forgiven. So the law tells me I have a problem. I'm a sinner. But Jesus took all my sins 
Jesus lived a perfect life and he gave me his perfect life. Law tells me I have to be perfect, perfectly perfect. The gospel tells us that Jesus' perfect life is credited to our account. That's good news. That's the gospel.